Okay, well, welcome again to a joint webinar from the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program and the Center for Workers' Compensation Studies on effective interventions to combat opioid misuse studies from the field of opioid prescription management. My name is Steve Wurzelbacher, and I direct the NIOSH Center for Workers' Compensation Studies. It's my pleasure to serve as one of the moderators for today's webinar. On behalf of the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program and the Workers' Comp Center, we are delighted to have you with us today. After a short introduction from Dr. Chase, Casey Chosewood, who's the Director of the Office for Total Worker Health, we'll hear from Dr. Quan Chi Chang, and Dr. Chang is a Senior Evaluation Specialist at the Chief Evaluation Office of the U.S. Department of Labor. Then we will hear from Dr. Yanni Ben Shalom, and Dr. Ben Shalom is a Senior Researcher at Mathematica's Center for Study and Disability Policy. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Bill Shaw. Dr. Shaw is an Associate Professor in Chief Division of Occupational Environmental Medicine, Department of Medicine, University of Connecticut School of Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut, and he is affiliated with the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace. Now, it is my pleasure to pass along to Dr. Chosewood. Hello, good day, everybody. Thank you, Steve. It's our pleasure to join the Workers' Compensation Center to bring you guys this important information today. So what is it about work uh, or the lack of work in some cases uh, that's really contributing to a very important other, if you will, uh, epidemic that the nation is facing. Uh, unfortunately, deaths due to opioid overdose uh, and um, other drugs is, is still a major issue in our country. And we're wanting to examine a bit more closely why some workers are at higher risk than others. And how can we use this platform of work, if you will, to better intervene in this critical issue? As, it, as many of you know and are familiar with the Total Worker Health Program, we're taking a very comprehensive view of this issue. Clearly, this is a challenge that affects both people at work and away from work. It has personal implications. It has livelihood implications. It has health and safety, health and safety implications. So we believe it's important to take this very comprehensive view of this challenge and find solutions that can help workers and employers um, and the nation as a whole make it through this, uh, this epidemic. On the next slide, we're going to take a, a closer look at the opioid crisis in the US. Unfortunately, drug overdose deaths in the US, especially from opioids, remain high. We did have a slight flattening of the curve in 2018 and into 2019, but unfortunately that does not appear to be holding. Uh, it's not the case in 2020. Largely that's uh, in many folks believe it because of the coronavirus and the great societal upheaval that that has caused our nation. More on that in just a second. But in the last 20 years, about 750,000 people have died in the US from an overdose. Uh, 446,000 of those from opioids. This is more than the lives lost from HIV infection in a period of time that's only half as long. So this is a critical issue. And obviously no surprise to you guys that opioids are strongly implicated as the leading or most common cause of death. Um, drug mixtures also increasingly common as well as causes of death in uh, these overdoses. On the next slide, we explore the link between opioids and work. Uh, certainly not having a job at all increases the risk for overdose death. Having an insecure job, certain types of gig employment, some of the new employment arrangements where there's no guarantee of an ongoing paycheck appears to be implicated in increasing the risk. Having a bad job, one that's hazardous, that causes frequent injury, or maybe causes chronic day in and day out pain also is a risk factor for overdose death. Lack of certain benefits like, sick, like paid sick leave is an additional risk factor. And clearly there are some industries and occupations that are at higher risk than others. And this isn't to cast any um, aspersions on certain uh, types of workers, but rather to implicate some of the working conditions that these workers have to endure. There are some estimates that between one in five and one in six construction workers in the US has a substance use disorder. And this is a tragedy because this is driving many of the increased deaths that we see. Um, and it really calls on us to think about ways we can intervene to improve the quality of work, the benefits, the quality of the employment contract among these workers to help intervene. 
On the next slide, we can clearly see that this is a crisis of working age people. 95% of those overdose deaths in 2017 were among people age 15 to 64. About 4% of workers report illicit opioid use in the past year, and two thirds of these were employed either full or part time. Overdose deaths at work for non-medical use of drugs increased about 25% per year uh, within the last decade, and about 5.3% of workplace overdose deaths in the U.S. Um, occurred uh, due to opioids compared to only 1.8% in 2013. This rate obviously varies by state, by region of the country, by industry and occupation. Uh, in some states, we've seen drug overdose deaths as the leading cause of work-related fatalities. So this is a significant issue. On the next slide, let's take a quick look at some of the data. This is from one of the earliest CDC publications that focused on industry and occupation as a significant risk factor for opioid overdose. And this study showed drug overdose deaths were highest for six occupation groups, construction, extraction, and here I want you to think oil and gas and mining workers, food preparation and serving, healthcare practitioners, healthcare support professions, and personal care and service workers. Unfortunately, this um, is, is an ongoing crisis in many of these professions today. On the next slide, we're gonna take a quick look at the impact of COVID-19 on opioid use disorder. Unfortunately, more than 40 states have reported increases in opioid-related mortality during the time period of the pandemic compared to the previous year. SAMHSA Distress Helpline has seen nearly a 900% increase in calls compared to the same period last year. Folks are more isolated. They're oftentimes less social supports. They have less access to services like counseling, therapy, or medication-assisted treatment. There also seem to be disruptions to the drug market, which may lead to more harmful drugs being on the street or altered drug use patterns among users and clearly reduced services and access to those services for a number of folks across the country as well. But I want to leave you with some hope. On the next slide, I'll just share with you some of the resources that NIOSH has put together uh, to intervene for this crisis. Here you see our products for first responders who are in the, um, obviously in sort of the eye of the storm when it comes to dealing with illicit drugs. Think here, your police, firefighters, first responders. We have a great toolkit on ways to help keep them safe. We also have products on naloxone to reduce or to reverse opioid overdose in the workplace. We have workplace solutions documents on medication assisted treatment, which is the gold standard of care for opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, only about one in five people are currently receiving the gold standard of care. So there's lots of work to be done there. And our newest set of web pages focuses on the topic of workplace supported recovery. What is the role of employers in this space? I invite you to take a look at those resources. I'll just end by sharing our website information, invite you to Google NIOSH opioids to find out more. You'll be able to reach all of our resources there. And certainly if you have questions that I can help with, please feel free to give me, uh, send me an email, I'll be happy to help. With that, I will pass it back to Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right, Th thank you, Casey. And so Quan Chi, um, next up, we're gonna have Quan Chi uh, talk about recent DOL CEO efforts in addressing opioid misuse and related work issues. Good afternoon, my name is Quan Chi Chang. Um, I'm part of the senior staff at the Chief Evaluation Office at the Department of Labor. Very happy to be here. Uh, in a few minutes, Dr. Ben Shilong and Dr. Shaw will be sharing findings from a recent report of a study funded by the CEO. And I would like to take a, a couple minutes to quickly give you a little background of my office and some highlights of our recent efforts. A uh, quick dis disclaimer, the views presented here are those of myself and do not necessarily represent the view of DOL or its components. The so central work of the Chief Evaluation Office is to build evidence in labor research and to support DOL agencies 
doing their work um, as effective as possible. So we work closely with se all 17 DOL agencies and support their wide variety of work. We are currently funding and overseeing approximately 66 active projects, and they include some very large long-term program evaluation conducted by independent research contractor and some median um, and smaller scale uh, research projects that's uh, using administrative data and behavioral insight studies. We also manage the department's clearinghouse for labor evaluation and research um, that has summarized over 1,000 labor related studies across 18 topics today. On the CEO's website, you can find our research project in 12 different topic areas. One of them is uh, substance use disorder and work. I will quickly talk about three studies in this topic area. Next slide, please. Um, a major area that DOL is seeking to address is the employment challenges uh, related to opioid and substance use crisis. Um, as Casey uh, has summarized, uh, uh, people with opioid use disorder and other substance use disorder could ex experience a variety of challenges in obtaining and maintaining employment, not to mention that a lot of time employers um, might not be willing to um, retain and hire um, people who are suffer from, from opioid and substance use disorder. To help address these issues, DOL's Employment and Training Administration, ETA, has launched a uh, grant called National Health Emergency Dislocated uh, Worker Grant. Uh, this grant utilizes grant money to provide employment and the training services to individuals affected by opioid crisis and to encourage more individuals to enter professions such as health healthcare workforce that could help address the crisis. Next slide, please. So DOL, um, uh, what CEO does uh, is to quickly uh, launch a evaluation project after uh, ETA has an, a worthy the uh, NHE grant, um, CEO start the evaluation project to collect important data to understand the type of services that are offered by the grantee, what challenges do the grantee encounter and identify the services and factors appear to be effective or promising. Currently, the research project of this uh, research team is conducting remote service, uh, remote site visits to collect data, but I would like to draw your attention uh, to a excellent literature review that the project has produced. It summarized the existing evidence in the intersection of employment and opioid crisis. You can follow the link to find the literature review and resource guide on the CEO website. Next slide, please. DOL, DOL has recently launched another grant project, um, uh, support to communities to provide training and employment services to individuals suffer from opioid crisis. Uh, the grants are similar to the NHE grants, but has a focus on innovative practices and community partnership. Uh, again, CEO uh, funded a, a new contract to carry out an evaluation project to collect important information to understand the grants implementation and to inform policymakers. Next slide, please. Uh, another DOL agency that has done a great deal of work to combat opioid use disorder is the Office of Workers' Compensation Program. OWCP has initiated initiated new policy to protect federal injured workers. The new policy include many aspects such as setting limits to new prescription and a limit to the number of refills. And also uh, for long-term climate, OWCP work with treating physicians to provide tailored individ individualized treatment to help the climate. It is against this backdrop, CEO founded the project Workers' Compensation and the Opioid Epidemic to generate evidence and information to help OWCP's effort. So next, Dr. Ben Shalom and Dr. Shaw will tell you more about this project and present the finding from our report. You can find more information about the project following this link. Next slide, please. If you have any question about CEO, any of the CEO project, please let me know. Thank you.
Thank you, Quan Chi. Um, and thank you for the, to the NASH folks for inviting us to present this webinar. This, this is Yanni Ben Shalom, and I apologize if you're not seeing uh, me on your screen. Um, I'm having connection issues this morning. Um, but we're very happy to have this opportunity to present findings uh, from our review uh, of opioid prescription management strategies. Um, and, and if we have time, we'll also give you a quick look at a couple of new studies that we have just started on. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is a brief overview of today's presentation. Um, we'll briefly describe uh, the project uh, that, that uh, Quan Chi mentioned and, and then uh, present findings from a first project report uh, on the state of the field in opioid prescription management. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, towards the end, uh, we hope to also uh, briefly summarize a couple of new studies that we're working on. You can skip two slides here. So we're on the project overview. Um, as mentioned, this project is funded by uh, the Office of the CEO at DOL. Um, and in the first phase of the project, we focused on knowledge development. So uh, I think as many of you know, in the last uh, five or six years, there has been a lot of new research on different opiate prescription policies, uh, both in workers' compensation and in other healthcare settings. Uh, but not much work uh, out there had systematically reviewed the existing evidence, uh, at least when we started this uh, a couple of years ago. And so the environmental scan we present uh, here can inform the Department of Labor and other stakeholders interested in the health of U.S. workers about promising policy options. Um, and in the second phase of the project, we're now turning the focus to generating new evidence with a focus on understanding factors associated with opioid use among workers. Uh, we have a, a, a one study that looks at the role of industry and occupation um, and, and how that uh, affects variation across states. And the second study is about the impact of COVID-19, um, as uh, uh, Casey mentioned earlier, uh, is obviously an important issue. Okay, so moving on to the state of the field in opioid prescription management, we can skip to the next slide. Uh, we have a slide that shows the report cover. Um, there's also a link to the project page um, at uh, CEO's website. Um, it was released in August, and um, I do want to mention this was a team effort, and I want to acknowledge the important contributions of our colleagues, uh, Jap Poo, Marisa Shank, Megan McIntyre, and Wen Jezu. Next slide, please. Also want to acknowledge the very helpful contributions of a technical working group we had uh, convened in April of 2019. Um, that includes Marion Cloran from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Jamie May from Washington State Department of uh, uh, Labor and Industries, Adam Seidner at the Hartford, Vanella Tamula at WCRI, and Amy Lee from the Texas Department of Insurance. Uh, th this uh, group reviewed and provided valuable feedback on our work very early in the process. Next slide. So for this study, our objectives were um, to identify programs and policies for managing opioid prescriptions. Uh, we wanted to consider a variety of intervention categories, settings, and research designs, and to describe existing evidence, uh, gaps in the evidence, and implications for new research or initiatives. In terms of sources, we looked at relevant previous reports and websites, but most of the studies came from a, a targeted literature search. And we, we also wanted to clarify the scope here. We, we focused on interventions with a direct goal of reducing opiate prescriptions. We did not focus on uh, non-pharmacological approaches to pain management or on treatments of opioid disorder and addiction. Um, there's, uh, of course, a lot of good work in, in those areas too. Uh, we also did not look specifically for employer-driven strategies, um, but our search terms would not have ruled those out. Uh, but as a preview, we didn't really find anything employer-driven, um, and, and we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about that again uh, towards the end. Next slide, please. I also wanted to highlight a couple of recent publications that overlap considerably uh, with our report, and, and these are reports that were not available when we started uh, this effort. Uh, the first is uh, evidence for state, community, and system level prevention strategies to, to address the opioid crisis uh, by Hegerich uh, et al. Um, these are co-authors primarily from the National, National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. It is an update of a systematic review they did uh, first uh, in 2014. 
uh, and they cover roughly the same period uh, of time that we, we cover. They, they look at 2013 to 2018. Um, some key differences from our uh, study is that uh, they have some different classification of studies into intervention categories um, and the nature of detail they provide on each study and its findings are a bit different. So even if you are familiar with that uh, work, I think uh, you'll find some interesting findings uh, in our report as well. Um, notably compared to uh, that review, we do not include uh, studies of interventions focused on naloxine, uh, naloxine education and distribution uh, which is the largest category of studies in, in, in that paper. Uh, the other paper by Schuller et al. Um, is about the state of science and opioid policy research. Uh, Co-authors are primarily from uh, RAND Corporation, and they looked at studies from 2005 to 2018. Uh, they have somewhat different intervention categories. Um, ours are, in, in some sense, more granular. Um, but again, a, a lot of overlap and a lot of uh, interesting findings in that report um, in addition to ours. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide just lists the extracted uh, study components. Um, we extracted these components and, and along with our report, we also have a, a large matrix in Excel um, with a lot of uh, detailed information that you can uh, see at that link too. Um, but just for example, we, we uh, abstracted the intervention category, what was the general type of the intervention, uh, we provided an overview of the intervention, uh, basically describing what was done, um, and a more detail on the research design, um, how was uh, the effectiveness of the intervention assessed. Next slide. So overall, our review included 134 studies and the 13 intervention categories that you can see on the slide. Um, we, we found a substantial amount of evidence uh, from 15 or more studies for five types of interventions, uh, those interventions that you see at the top half here. Uh, so prescription guidelines, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs or PDMPs, dispensing limits, multifaceted interventions and provider education. Uh, for all of those, we, we had a, a good uh, amount of studies that, that we could synthesize. Uh, we found relatively fewer studies, uh, six or less, on other, uh, another eight intervention types. Um, so we're going to focus our presentation of findings today mostly on the five categories where we found substantial evidence. Next slide. Um, one thing that made our review challenging were the many, many different outcome measures used across the studies. Uh, some counted opioid pills prescribed, others counted claims with opioids, and others measured adherence to guidelines. You know, that's just a, 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 a brief look at, at this long list. Um, and so that definitely created challenges for us. Um, next slide. And the studies interventions, they, they were all implemented in a wide variety of settings, uh, which we've listed here. Again, some examples are uh, private health systems or hospitals, primary care clinics, emergency departments, the Medicaid insurance program, workers' compensation plans, and so forth. Um, but again, nothing, nothing specifically at the place of work. Next slide. So uh, we're going to uh, describe what we have found for substantial uh, for the interventions with substantial evidence. Uh, we're going to go over each of these five categories uh, now and highlight an exemplar study for each. Um, and I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, Bill Shaw uh, to get us started with prescription guidelines. Thanks, Yanni, and <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're going to walk you through a couple different categories of uh, policy intervention programs. And the first one is <clears throat> prescription guidelines, which was probably uh, not surprisingly the most frequently studied uh, policy change. Uh, these are prescription guidelines that are either instituted by federal and state authorities or in some cases uh, put out by uh, professional associations and medical organizations. And uh, we were interested in how well these contributed to reductions in opioid prescribing rates. I think it's important to note that there are two different kinds of studies that fell in this category. Uh, one was looking at the effects of just issuing um, a guideline. So, for example, looking at the impact of um, the release of this guidelines for opiate prescribing in chronic pain. Uh, and then other studies really looked at uh, adoption and implementation processes. So within, say, a healthcare system or a state um, 
agency uh, looking at how well those guidelines could actually be implemented. So, so we had kind of had two different types of studies in this group. And we're going to show you results by category in this kind of scorecard fashion that you see at the bottom of the slide here. Um, studies that were, and we're going to contrast stronger and weaker research designs to try to give you a sense of, of um, the level of evidence. So um, stronger research designs were things that we felt were relatively free from bias, like an interrupted um, time series analysis or something of that nature. And the weaker research designs were things where, you know, not everything could be really satisfactorily controlled for to rule out others for sources of bias. So, um, so you can see from the, the, the table here that uh, there were 11 studies that we felt were stronger research designs and 14 that were weaker. Um, and uh, you know, generally uh, the findings in, across both stronger and weaker designs were, were supportive uh, on, the, on the order of about 75 to 80% of studies reporting positive findings. So overall, I think there's strong evidence that um, you know, either um, publishing guidelines uh, on the one hand or implementing guidelines are, are effective ways to um, alter opioid prescribing rates. And so if you go to the next slide, we'll show you an example of a study. Uh, this is by Garg and colleagues, um, an article that was published in 2013 in the Journal of Pain. Um, and this study was conducted in the state of Washington, um, uh, where all state agencies um, had implemented an opioid dosing guideline on safe prescribing practices for chronic non-cancer pain. And the state of Washington is a little unique uh, in that it has a single payer workers compensation system that's managed uh, through their Department of Labor and Industries. And so they have access to workers comp data uh, through the state system. Um, and the data you see here are for about 160,000 workers comp claims uh, from 2004 to 2010 before and after this 2007 guideline was implemented. Uh, so this was an interrupted time series analysis and you can see the change in slope after the 2007 guideline was published for the state. Uh, the unit of measurement here uh, is the number of claims per month with any opioid prescription in the workers comp system and the authors concluded a 25 percent reduction in the number of cases with an opioid prescription from 2004 to 2010 with a significant break at the time that the um, guideline was adopted. Um, so it's also interesting to note that this is one of the earliest studies that was published in this, this type of uh, policy change area. And uh, this reduction from 2007 to 2010 that's shown here was actually you know, bucking a national trend for increasing opioid prescribing elsewhere at the same time. So um, you know, if, if I think that if it makes these results even more compelling is that it was at a time when, when really opioid prescribing was still increasing in most of the country um, and they were able to um, institute a, a reduction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Yanni, this one's yours. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, so moving now to, to PDMPs, uh, we had 24 studies of PDMPs and 12 of them had uh, research designs that we deemed to be stronger and 10 of those found positive impacts. Um, but, and just uh, to give an overview, PDMPs are electronic database systems that nearly all states use. Uh, they allow or require providers to check that patients are not receiving opioids from multiple sources. Um, and based on our review, the evidence suggests that PDMPs have reduced opioid prescribing rates um, and our efforts underway to improve the integration between states and within electronic, uh, electronic medical record systems. Uh, next slide. So our exemplar study here for this category uh, is about Indiana's emergency rules uh, for opioid prescribing, which involved use of the state PDMP, uh, but also a few other measures. Um, and what you can see here is high frequency data that they used to formally test for an impact after the rule was implemented. Uh, this is just one figure from the study uh, and it shows how the average daily morphine equivalent dose or MED per script changed after the rules were implemented. Um, and so you have the average MED on the vertical axis and you have uh, the date on the horizontal axis. Uh, and what you can see is a slight downward trend until uh, late 2013 and then a much steeper decline after that, uh, which the authors attribute to the policy change. Um, there's also an immediate change in the predicted line um, around January 2014, uh, and that's a reduction of about six, of six MEDs or about a 10% drop. Um, so get very compelling findings. Um, an interesting finding here uh, that's in particular, uh, particular to workers' comp uh, 
uh, is that the they found that the emergency rule had the highest impact on workers' compensation payments, um, then on Medicare and Medicaid payments, and then on uh, uh, patients of private uh, insurers. So um, uh, we thought that was interesting that the largest impact was um, for, for the workers' comp cases. Down to dispensing limits, uh, next slide. So here we, we had a, a good number of studies too, 23 studies. Um, uh, and dispensing limits uh, is a pretty broad category. Uh, we included here uh, drug formularies uh, that, that are now implemented by workers' compensation uh, regulators in 12 states, uh, prior authorization requirements, um, and other policies that somehow limit the amount of opioids uh, or the circumstances in which they uh, can be prescribed. Um, relative to PDMPs, that there were fewer uh, studies that we deemed to be uh, to, to have a stronger uh, evaluation design. Um, but of those four, uh, three found positive impacts, um, and among the weaker studies, uh, most found positive impacts as well. Next slide. So the exemplary study here is from Massachusetts, um, and here they gradually rolled out reduced thresholds for prior authorization um, in terms of uh, the MED limit. So they first introduced the limit of uh, 360 MEDs, then uh, reduced it to 240 and then to 120. Um, and so the mean and median average daily MED, which are shown here, uh, they fell dramatically over this long period, uh, but what we should know that this, this is a quite a long period to track uh, um, outcomes and the vertical lines highlight what happened after each change. So uh, around the first intervention, um, that's when they introduced the 360 MED threshold. Uh, we don't really see a sharp drop uh, due to prior authorization uh, around those lines. Um, and then there's a, a quite a long period of steady decline for both measures. Uh, but then after the second intervention, uh, we see a clear decline in both lines, uh, and the same again after the third intervention uh, wh when the thresholds were reduced to 120. Uh, Bill, back to you for the next slide. All right. Um, the next category uh, we called multifaceted interventions. So these were programs policy changes that um, didn't fit neatly within any of our other categories and involved a, a combination of approaches. Um, <clears throat> if you think about the kind of complex nature of opioid use and prescribing, it's probably not um, unexpected that, you know, a lot of the approaches have really combined many different um, strategies that uh, are able to address different kinds of levels. Uh, so levels of, pro of providers, patients, systems, um, and organizations. So, uh, so we had 17 of s studies from this area. They, a typical kind of combination of things would be, um, you know, including uh, adoption of guidelines, uh, provider education, uh, and tracking, uh, patient and consumer outreach, different changes in patient uh, management strategies, and some data-driven solutions as well. So <clears throat> we had a number from this category, and uh, most of them were weaker study designs, probably because of the complicated nature of trying to analyze things at multiple levels. Um, but um, of these, of, of the three strongest studies, all three of them showed positive findings. And of the weaker study designs, uh, 11 of 14 uh, showed positive findings as well. So, I mean, it could be that kind of intervening at multiple levels is probably the thing that maybe gives you the biggest uh, bang for your buck in terms of policy change. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example of this now on the next slide. Uh, these are data from a study published by Von Korf and colleagues in 2016. And again, this is in the state of Washington, but this time, instead of being the state workers comp system, this, these are data from uh, the Group Health Cooperative, which is a large uh, healthcare uh, entity in the Seattle area, I believe. Um, and what they did was they implemented a multifaceted intervention strategy that was rolled out between 2007 and 2010, which is the dashed lines here. And it was generally focused on providers. Um, and, then and then the line on the top here is a kind of comparison or control group that they tried to use, which was um, physicians outside of their practice who were also seeing their patients. So these were contract physicians who were not actually part of their um, normal uh, um, 
uh, provider um, em employed uh, people, but but were provided a, a useful comparison group. So the intervention here uh, involved provider education, increased accountability and tracking of prescribing. Uh, there was peer guidance and oversight for high prescribers. So there was kind of a corrective action that was taken for high prescribers. Um, they also instituted mandatory urine drug testing for patients before prescribing um, and mandatory monitoring visits afterward. Uh, increased patient documentation and risk assessment at the time of prescriptions. Um, and there were changes made to like the automated prescription refill process and their electronic medical record system. So this example of implementing many things at the same time. And the data you see here uh, compare the opioid prescribing between about 16,000 patients seen by their usual providers and 5,000 seen by um, these contract providers. And uh, again, this is an interrupted time series analysis. And you can see the change of slope during the time that these organizational changes were put into place. Um, and the unit of measurement here is the percent of patients, um, of, the, of the, the denominator here is actually patients who were receiving chronic opioid therapy. And the unit of measurement is the percent of these patients who received a higher than recommended dose during that period. Uh, they concluded a 63% reduction in high dose cases over this time span. And their analyses also showed that this was a, a greater reduction than among contract providers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the next category is uh, provider education. And uh, you know, obviously this has been sort of a foundational part of many uh, strategies to reduce opioid prescribing, but there are studies that look at this uh, as a standalone uh, policy change. Um, so this has involved training providers to you know, usually follow more effective opioid prescribing practices, sometimes in combination with other strategies. Um, and I think what's interesting here is that um, the evidence sort of suggests that just putting doctors into a training, a didactic training session is probably not enough. And that uh, what we saw examples of were many efforts to actually have peer uh, feedback and advice and data tracking systems that actually kind of help reinforce these trainings. So I think we saw a lot of evidence of that. We had 15 studies in total, uh, four were stronger designs and 11 were weaker designs. But again, most of them showed positive uh, results of provider education, especially when paired with other kinds of reinforcers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an example of one of these studies uh, by Meisenberg and colleagues. Um, this was conducted in the Anne Arundel Healthcare System, which is a, a large uh, healthcare entity in Maryland and mo focused mostly on provider education. Um, uh, this, this was one of the examples of provider training uh, also re reinforced through accountability and tracking in the data systems um, and providing online tools to clinicians to help them um, uh, know whether their prescribing was uh, guideline adherent or not. Um, the data you see here, are, are, are they don't give exact numbers, but it's hundreds of providers and millions of patient visits over time. So it's a very large uh, system. Uh, and the unit of analysis here is the monthly average uh, morphine milligram equivalents per prescription. Um, so anytime an opioid was prescribed, they were just looking at dose control. And they concluded from this interrupted time series analysis that there was a 34% reduction in the number of high dose prescriptions uh, as a result of this uh, um, uh, provider uh, training program. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we're going to turn to, you know, we, we've, we've, we've described for you the five uh, L, uh, primary uh, policy areas where there was a lot of evidence. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of them where there were only a handful of studies, but are perhaps some of the more innovative and, and uh, interesting strategies, strategies moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So, um, one of these was, was laws and policies. Obviously, this is a pretty um, strong hammer for changing um, opioid prescribing behavior. And probably the biggest example we have, um, apart from PDMPs and other things like that that we've already talked about, was rescheduling of some opioid uh, prescription uh, uh, products that um, made it more difficult to prescribe um, and changing it from, from ske one schedule to another. So. We have ex we found examples of evaluations of laws and regulations that were changed, and and those sh showed pretty compelling evidence of being able to change behavior. Another thing that we saw frequently was automated alert systems, so kind of reminding providers when uh, at the time that they're prescribing um, that those are um, out of normal uh, guideline uh, evidence, um, and and there were particularly some good examples of this from the VA system. 
Um, we also saw examples of predictive modeling. So using uh, data sources, you know, in large healthcare systems about your patients to try to uh, look for potentially patients who are high risk um, and being able to identify them um, beforehand. So if, if you have a patient that's been seen in a healthcare system for many years and has hundreds and hundreds of, of office visits, it's sometimes difficult for providers to be able to um, you know, know the history of this patient from all of those records. So, so allowing computer systems to do that for you might be a, a possible intervention strategy that looks effective. And lastly, pharmacist interventions were um, uh, one of the smaller uh, examples from policy change. And this was to basically use pharmacists as kind of the whistleblowers on, on high opioid prescribing and, and, and have introducing interventions where pharmacists call the prescribing provider at the moment that um, a prescription is trying to be filled to, to offer uh, different suggestions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other things that we found, uh, we were not really looking at opioid use disorder treatments per se, but we did see uh, a lot of evidence of interest in opioid tapering. So we have a lot of you know, legacy cases of people who are on high dose opioids and, and the strategy for trying to uh, you know, wean them off of opioids and provide the kind of psychological support and other sorts of education, patient education that's necessary um, was a source of uh, some intervention strategies that looked effective. Um, also interest in other medications. The pharmaceutical industry is very busy trying to find a less addictive um, re replacement products for some of the um, previous um, products that uh, have been the subject of many of these studies and uh, NSAIDs is one of them and there are other things probably coming to market soon. Um, uh, patient education. So there were examples of, of really reaching out to patients as consumers and having them demand more from their providers and their systems to help um, um, use more responsible uh, opioid prescribing practices. Uh, and lastly, inf information sharing. So um, you know, we saw the example of PDMPs with states uh, trading information across state boundaries, but also um, you've probably seen more evidence, maybe even from your own uh, health system of, of information being shared across uh, insurers, across uh, different kinds of healthcare systems around prescribing uh, of, of, of patients. Um, next slide, please. So we wanted to just give you some key takeaways from having looked through uh, these 134 studies that we think are, are important takeaways. Next slide, please. Um, it looks like uh, one thing that we saw evidence of was that um, multi-pronged approaches are probably the, the best and, and are, are most likely to reach all the different kinds of uh, issues that um, are factors in opioid prescribing practices. Uh, we also uh, could see a lot of examples of you know, really trying to use electronic medical record systems and other data and technology solutions, um, leveraging those to try to reinforce um, evidence-based prescribing practices um, seem to be you know, used more and more. Um, and then lastly, the education and training didn't seem to be effective unless it was, it was sort of married to some kind of reinforcement system of, of, of tracking um, provider practices or providing uh, peer-based reinforcement and feedback. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, you know, there's large and growing evidence that, that many of the changes that have been put in place are effective. Um, the scientific evaluations, uh, some have been stronger and more rigorous than others, but in general, they all uh, show very similar positive findings across studies. Uh, and no one policy appeared to be, you know, a great, much, much better than any others. We thought maybe a multifaceted approach was probably best. And, uh, and obviously choices in terms of which policy that you want to implement uh, change or depends a lot on context and, and what kind of system that you're, you're thinking about. Um, Next slide. And I, I think we started off this presentation talking about employers and the evidence that um, the, the workers in more physical occupations and, and other kinds of factors seem to be um, important here. And obviously um, uh, opioid use has impacts both in the workplace and out of the workplace, but we actually found no policy level um, uh, programs or intervention studies that have been studied around employers. And, you know, we were focusing mostly on opioid prescribing, so maybe it's not a big surprise, but I think that there's a lot of work to be done yet in trying to understand how employers might be able to have some influence with their healthcare providers and insurance companies to, to, to try to um, uh, reinforce some of these uh, policy changes in opioid prescribing. Um, next slide, please. 
So uh, now back to uh, Yanni with uh, some information about new studies. Do we, Yanni, are you on mute? Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the system automatically <laughs> muted me. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to go quickly over these two new studies that I mentioned. Uh, so, so we so we do have time for uh, a few questions. Um, next slide. So the first new analysis um, is where we're looking at factors associated with opioid use among workers, um, with a focus on the role of industry and occupation. Um, and, and we know that a group from NIOSH is also working on this topic. Um, and they also uh, provided us uh, early feedback uh, on the study, which we really appreciated. Uh, we also coordinated with them to make sure that we address different perspectives on a separate studies. Um, so, what, so we actually use restricted data uh, and uh, NCHS, uh, so we can look at state level variation. Uh, the, the state level uh, information is only available in the, in the restricted data. So the goal of this study is to understand factors associated with opioid use among workers. Um, and our hypothesis is that geographic variation in opioid use uh, reflects variation in industry mix, opioid prescribing practices, and other factors. And so our research question is, uh, how does state level variation in non-medical use relate to state level variation in industry and occupation and other state level and individual characteristics? The data we use for this study is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, uh, specifically individual level data on non-medical use of opioids and worker characteristics. Uh, we focus on non-medical use uh, because that, that's uh, the outcome that is measured in um, the survey uh, for those years. Uh, um, we, we look at 2004, 2014. Uh, we had to use, uh, to go back to that uh, time period to make sure that we can uh, uh, look at industry and occupation. In terms of methods, we look at the prevalence of non-medical use of opioids uh, by state, industry and occupation, and individual characteristics. Um, and then we conduct multi-level uh, regression to determine uh, how the different factors contribute to the individual level variation that we're seeing in non-medical use. Next slide. Um, so uh, here we look at the impact of opioid of COVID-19 on employment and, and ultimately on opioid use. Um, and here too, we're focused uh, on, on differences by industry. We want to use uh, the variation across counties uh, in the nation, um, the variation in industry mix in those counties to tease out the effect of COVID-19 on opioids. Um, I think as Casey shown, we'll, 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 we expect to find an uh, impact and, and uh, the contribution here is to see how the industry mix is really playing a role and, and, and variations that we see across uh, the country. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, the hypothesis here is that the COVID-19 has major effects on the labor market with variations across geographies and industries, and the pandemic and other factors may also influence opioid use. Some of this uh, through the job market, um, through increased job stress and reduced earnings, um, and, and, uh, but also through other factors like uh, access to medication um, and, and uh, mental health uh, factors. So the research question is, what is COVID-19's pandemic causal impact on opioid use? Um, uh, we use county quarter data on employment overall and by industry, uh, data on positive cases and deaths, and uh, levels of opioid distribution. Uh, here we're using uh, DEA data that looks at actual opioids distributed to different parts of the country. Um, and I'll just stop here to make sure that we have time for questions, uh, but that, that was just a brief description of those two studies um, that were very early in the beginning uh, of the studies, and, but very much looking forward to uh, completing them and, and sharing uh, findings from those studies uh, when we have them. Next slide, please. And so that's the end of our presentation. Um, Stephen, did, do you want to moderate the, the Q&A? Sure. Well, well, thanks everybody for presenting. Just, you know, I just wanted to reiterate that there are links um, embedded in the presentations too, and, and the full reports are all of, are available. We had mentioned that the 
recording will be available online for the link and, and if you uh, want to request a copy of the um, presentation, please send in an email uh, to TWH. Um, so as far as questions, please type in your questions into the Q&A box rather than the chat because they can be tracked more easily there. And um, as far as that goes, guys, this, the questions you can see are, are appearing up there. I wanted to make sure that you could see those, the, all the speakers if you go to the Q&A box. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read the first one. And then from here, really, um, in the essence of time, if there are particular ones that you would like to answer, uh, please go ahead and, and do that. All right, so the first person that asked, could you explain if there are, are any comparisons between different data groups so that you could see if a specific industry or agency is providing accurate data of the impact of workers and in, in interventions? That question came in pretty early in the presentation, so I'm not, it's not directed at a particular speaker, but if anybody could address that. Yeah, it's, well, it's a good question. I. I uh, Yoni, is there any way to take two different data sets and compare them that would give you some kind of information about um, like variations by industry? Um, variation by industry. Um, like if, if, if there's variation across different data sources um, in the reporting, that would to me would yeah. be the only thing we could probably find that would signal maybe there's some uh, Underreporting or or uh, inaccurate information. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but you know the, the data that we are using for for one of our um, current studies is, is the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, and as I said, um, the, the, that survey dropped the industry and occupation question um, after 2014, and so that that data is a bit outdated. Though we are using it because we are interested in this particular question. Um, so I'm not sure this answers your question, but that, that is one data source where we have information about industry and occupation. Um, if you're looking to, to compare um, two different data sets to, to validate what you're seeing in one industry and, and see if uh, the two data sets corroborate that information, um, I, I think I'll have to, to uh, uh, think a bit more about that particular question. I would also urge you to, to look at um, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, work also related to opioids coming out of, of the Workers' Compensation Research Institute, uh, WCRI, um, and, and there might be some information that's relevant to your question there too. And, and just to add one more thing, the, the, in the information that we're looking at is all from sources that are not coming through employers. So I, I don't think that you know, the kinds of things that we would normally be concerned about in underreporting injuries and things might, <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't seem to be a factor, at least in the data sets that we're using. All right, thanks. Um, so another question that came in uh, fairly early in the presentation was, can you comment on the issue of primary prevention of injury and stress that may lead to opioid use? It seems absent from the studies that are being presented. Yeah, I this is Bill, I think um, that's a great reflection. And I think this is uh, really, you know, indicative of the kind of information that's missing from studies uh, around opioid use disorder. And, it, and I think most of the evidence so far in the in published uh, uh, literature is that is really focused on physical demands of work and not mental demands of work. And this is certainly an area where uh, a lot more work could be done. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I can't think of a particular study that's really focused on um, occupations where, where mental health stressors might be more significant, but it's certainly a great question. Yeah, this is Casey. I would, I completely agree with you, Fair. There, this is a gap and, and an area where we're really interested in inspiring new research in this space. I would say some of the high risk occupations um, appear to be in that category of higher risk because of access to certain substances. And these are jobs that don't necessarily have significant physical demands, but certainly quite a bit of mental demand. Healthcare workers might be an example of that. And certainly healthcare workers have a mix of physical and, uh, and high mental uh, demand. And many of these occupations have a built-in level of stress, whether that be the physical demand of the job leading to you know, more general stress the insecurity of the work, which certainly 
is a, is a source of significant stress in the lives of workers when, when there's no guarantee of a paycheck week after week. So clearly this is an area where we need to learn more. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next question asked, uh, do you utilize studies from worker EAP programs that are geared towards specific employers? Um, I, I, I uh, this is a, an also a really good question, and I, I don't know of any national data sets that 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 describe um, utilization rates on EAP programs. But um, if we could find something like that, that would be really interesting to look at by industry. And so I, I, I think that's uh, something probably worth checking out a little bit. I, I'm not familiar, unless Yoni, do you have any um, knowledge of that? No, I was just about to say that I, I, I don't. I'm not aware. Um... I think those other projects where we were interested in uh, the role of EAPs, um, you know, more generally and 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 how they help uh, workers, uh, for example, you know, stay stay at work when they're encountering challenges. Um, and, and I don't recall there learning about any uh, data, you know, that is at least uh, uh, accessible for research. Um, but but I, I do agree that 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 would be an interesting uh, uh, aspect to look at as well. Yeah, this is Casey. I, I would agree that would be an exceptional uh, source of data, but oftentimes employers safeguard that information uh, or it never reaches the level of the employer. It stays in a firewall within the employee assistance program. One of the things that we're hearing, though, in the current pandemic is that demand for services from employee assistance professionals has gone through the roof. There's substantial increase in demand for EAP services. Um, that's being widely reported from many of our employer stakeholders. Okay, thanks again. Um, so there are some questions that were in the chat box, put in the chat box, and I'm going to go through those uh, now, right now too. So you may not be able to see these um, in the Q&A folks, but I'll, I'll just read through them. So a question was, just wondering if you have also worked on the interventions on opioid drug overuse mitigations for the underserved or minority ethnic groups, such as Hispanic construction workers, uh, such as culturally adapted non-pharmacological non approach. Uh, thanks. Yeah, well, as I, as I said, in, in the scope, we, we were not looking at non-pharmacological uh, pharmacological approaches. Um, although I do think there's a pretty good uh, report out there um, out of the National uh, Academy of uh, um, science and medicine. Um, they, they had a series of workshops uh, around that, and I think they have a report based on those uh, discussions. Um, in, in terms of the focus of the studies, uh, we, we didn't have a, a search criteria that specifically looked for those. Um, and I can't recall, you know, we had a lot of studies, 134 of them. I, I can't, I'm sure that uh, uh, several of them looked at uh, you know certain subgroups, uh, but I, I don't I'm, I don't recall anyone that targeted a, a specific subgroup in their interventions. Uh, Bill, maybe you have uh, something. Yeah, to add. No, well, I think the the question I think um, I think there maybe been a few examples of like looking at you know comparing gender or something like that in the studies that we looked at, but but there really was. Um, there were probably many opportunities to look at subgroups of patients who might be more vulnerable or might have different response to organizational policy interventions. And that was very seldom done. So a patient was just a patient and a prescription was a prescription. And there were very few efforts to try to, um, you know, really look at kind of social disparity issues or differences by by gender or occupation or, or things like that. So it was, it was probably there probably is could be more to learn about how policy changes around opioid prescribing may affect patients differently. Yeah, I would add that specifically to construction workers, we have a very strong partner looking at this issue uh, in CPWR. So if you go to CPWR.com, there's just a wealth of information about construction workers, the specific risks, interventions, training programs, resources, it really is a, a strong contributor to our understanding of the specific risks in this space. Um, they're partially funded by NIOSH. They also serve as our National Construction Safety Center. Uh, 
uh, providing a lot of research just about construction safety in general. So it's an excellent resource. Those interested in learning more about um, opioid and other challenges among construction workers. Okay, th thanks again. Um, so there's another question from the chat box. It says, regarding pharmacist and pharmacy policy and standards, it seems that this is an area and group of practitioners that can be key uh, to understanding options for safe use, tapering, and options for treatment. Did you find evidence that there are, are effective training and practices among pharmacy staff? Um, we had a few studies where um, there are some systems where, where pharmacy is incorporated. So like the VA system, as an example, where, where pharmacy operations are incorporated within the healthcare system. And that seemed to provide uh, a really great opportunity to um, get pharmacists involved in, in um, uh, you know, um, recognizing a high, a high uh, opioid dose um, or a long-term use that might not be uh, the best for that patient and, and bringing that back to the provider. So there was at least one study where um, any time that you, you exceeded a certain threshold of prescribing, uh, the pharmacist um, basically would not fill the prescription and would instead set, call the provider. And so there was a system set up around that. So I think, you know, pharmacists, I think in our privatized systems that you know it's a little difficult sometimes to make the connection between pharmacists and prescribers but um, certainly there are opportunities somewhere okay well well thanks everybody we we have run out of time unfortunately uh, but we were tracking questions that we didn't uh, get a chance to address live and, and we could reach out about those again the webinar was recorded and everybody who registered will be sent a link about that I just want to thank all of our speakers. It was fantastic content and really just a whole lot of uh, information that was provided, but in a, in a way that, that I thought was very easily to understand and follow. So thanks again for everyone's participation today and uh, stay safe and well.